Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Hey, I'm Joel. Happy Father's Day. Hey. Thanks. We're going to continue our series today called, uh, based, based on the idea of inflation, and it's the idea that even in the middle of prices rising, even in the middle of stock markets crashing, even in the middle of retirement, retirement savings going like this, we as followers of Christ has a ho- have a hope that's beyond Amen. any of the economies of man. Amen. The greatest economy man can come up with, there's two worlds, there's two worlds, very real worlds. We talked about this last week. There's a spirit world, and in God's economy, that spirit world, uh, you can thrive in the middle of even the most difficult of times. So we're talking about how we can thrive in the challenging times that we're facing right now. We talked about last week the fact that it's probably not going to get any better anytime soon. I hate to break the bad news to you, but it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. So things aren't going to get easier, so we have to get stronger. Life doesn't get easier, we have to get stronger. And of course, a lot of us, we say, man, I'm not strong as it is right now. I'm tired, I'm exhausted. And and we, we talked about last week the fact that you're not having to lean on your own strength. It says, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. And one of the challenges we have every day is figuring out how do we be strong in the Lord and the power of His might rather than trying to be strong in the power of our might because at some point you're going to come to the end of your strength. And things are going to keep getting hard around here. Um, We joked in the first service, we said, the country is being run by idiots. (laughs) On both sides, they're just idiots. And look, Jesus can love you and you still be an idiot. right. Right? I'm an example. Yes, Jesus loves you, but you're still an idiot. And uh, stupidity isn't a long-term game plan, but some people seem to think it is. So we just got to figure out how as Christians are we going to thrive in the middle of this chaos in the economies of man around us. And we talked about the fact that Jesus says, if you focus on the right thing, if you've got the right aim, it will lead to provision. He talks in Matthew 6, 33, he says, you're worried about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, the price of gas. He didn't say it that way, but I'm saying it that way. You're worried about how you're going to provide for your family in the middle of this. But I'm telling you this. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all that stuff you're worried about. It will materialize. How? I don't know because that's part of God's economy. I don't understand how it works. But when God's economy, when you aim at the right thing, God provides. The other thing we talked about is the fact that in God's economy... Lack does not limit. Just because you don't have the resources you think you need, it doesn't mean it limits what God can do. You, it, we talked about that verse. It says, in all things, uh, we, can do, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So we learn to be content in the situation we're in, recognizing that one touch of God's favor can change everything right. in an instant. Amen. So this morning, I want to talk about the importance of faith in God's economy. Because faith, in many ways is the currency, the hard cash of God's economy. In fact, it says without faith, it's impossible to please God. But I want to tell you a a story about the last year of my life and the ups and downs of the last year of my life. And then then I'm going to get to my main point here. But about a year ago, well, I said it was two years ago during COVID. um, Many of you know that I lead outdoor expeditions around the world. And so I take teams and we do... um, conferences in the outdoors so i'll take you know 12 18 people in fact the first time i reconnected with marcus after many years he came down to peru and hiked to machu picchu with me and uh we do these outdoor trips but you know with covid the world shut down and all of a sudden i realized how limited i was if the world is shut down so i i i got this idea in my mind and i felt like the lord put it in my heart to start a retreat center somewhere around here and i wanted to start a retreat center where people could come and we could go meet at one place and not be limited by restrictions. You know, if the world gets locked down again, again, the world's being run by idiots, so it could happen again. Uh, if the world gets locked down or something like that, I want to start a retreat center. So I started looking for land. I started looking for five acres. I thought that would be in our price point, and I could not find anything five acres. Anything five acres that popped that was in my price range, somebody from California bought it up instantly. Or New York. So I couldn't find anything. So I was talking to Dad about it. He was talking about... Our, th- my dad has a missions agency in Kerrville, and one of the challenges they face in Kerrville is there's missionaries always coming to Kerrville to get trained, get prepared to go on the international mission field, but there's a, a housing shortage of, out there in Kerrville, and then there's a hotel shortage, so hotels out there, it's like a Hampton Inn's like $200 a night, it's insane, 
So these poor missionaries are trying to raise $200 a night to stay at the Hampton Inn out there. And so he said, you know, I'd be willing to go in with you on this retreat center that we could use for pastors, for missionaries, and then you could use it for your retreat. So we started looking for more land. Now, my first concern was this. If you've read any of my books, all of my most traumatic childhood memories come from growing up in Kerrville. <laughs> so when dad's like, yeah, we could build it out here in Kerrville, I'm like, nee, Kerrville, no, no, no. Bad memories in that, right? I went through lots of counseling. I thought I was over it until this came up, right? But we had these, we, we, we bought eight, or, uh, we, my dad was a pastor of a church on 18 acres out in Kerrville, and it was just insane. The whole thing was insane. The whole, the whole situation was insane. Anyway, very traumatic for, for, for little Joel. So <laughs> no Kerrville for me. I don't want Kerrville, but, but we found this piece of land, and talk about the circle coming back around. I did a series on this a while back. It's on 16 and a half acres of land. And we were able to buy it with cash. So we bought this land. And I was like, sweet, we're going to build this retreat center. Now, I was naively optimistic, i.e. stupid, i.e. an idiot. We're using that word a lot lately today. But that's what I was. And I was like, I'm going to build these retreat center. I'm going to build these cabins by myself. I know enough stuff about stuff to do this. I can build these. So I had some people come out and evaluate, and everybody that came out and saw the land was like, hmm, this is going to be quite a project. Because I came to discover that the land we were building on was solid rock. <laughs> Literally. On Christ the solid rock I stand, like, also my land in Kerrville is a solid rock. <laughs> and a bunch of people were like, you ever done anything like this before? I'm like, no, no, but I'll figure it out. And they're like, hmm. All right. You know, Casey, right? He came out. He's like, oh, boy, you got quite a project on your hands. <laughs> so I started building these cabins. We got the shells out. We started building them out. Didn't know what I was doing. I watched a lot of YouTube videos. Uh, didn't require permits, so that made it really easy. Now you are like, I'd never stay in a cabin to well built, but here. <laughs> I started building out these cabins, and, it, and, 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 and I got involved in the, in the trenching of, for, the, for the electricity and the water, and it's, it's like solid rock. So we had to get this thing called a rock saw. You've seen them around. There are these giant tractors that have a giant circle uh, wheel on them, and they've got these diamond tips, and they have to tear through the rock. I mean, it was tearing up these, the, these diamond tips. We had to buy a bunch of different diamond tips for this thing because it kept breaking them. I mean, it's hard, hard rock. And all of a sudden, I got into this, and the more I got into it, the more I realized, what have I gotten myself into? This is way out of my range. I'm like, Lord, what did you give me here? Like, this gift is a lot of work. Anybody ever felt that way? Kids? Yeah. Church? This gift is a lot of work. Well, Bill Wilcox, he kind of sensed my, uh, he's, a, he's a guy here, he's a handyman that works here at the church, does all sorts of different stuff, just don't ask him to paint. But uh, he does all sorts of work. He's like, I'm going to come and help you on Thursday. So he started driving from Seguin all the way to Kerrville to help me. And man, I felt like such a burst of energy. I was like, thank you, Lord. You sent somebody to help me. But we did. We were working and we were working and we were working it. And it was just still such a slow project. Well, during that time, I went and spoke at a pastor's conference in Alabama. And while I was there, I was telling a guy about what we're doing. And he's like, well, I want to come see it. You know, everybody says that. I want to come see it. I'm like, yeah, whatever. You want to come see it. Everybody wants to see it when it's done. You don't want to see it when it's not done. <laughs> Everybody's like, oh, you're, that's, that's great. And then when it's done, they're like, oh, let me come see it. Yeah, you want to stay in my cabins. So <laughs> he came out. He actually flew out and looked at the property. And I was like, wow, that's cool. So I showed him the property. And by that point, though, I was fried, man. I was done. I was so burnt out on building this retreat center. I was just done. And I told Emily, I'm like, Emily, we got to get out of town. So we decided to go to Guatemala, where I grew up. And um, while we were down there, uh, you know, I grew up in Guatemala in Central America, and we would bring teams from the United States to build a hospital, and we built, brought medical teams and construction teams to build things out in the villages, and then we would, you know, serve the people in those villages. And at the end of the trip in Guatemala, every team, we would take them to this really nice hotel in this town just outside of Guatemala City, in a beautiful little colonial town. It's called Antigua, and it was, it's a super nice hotel. So I always vowed, I was like, one day when I grow up and get some money... A lot of money because it's super expensive. I'm going to stay in that hotel. Well, because of COVID, the hotel was dirt cheap. So I was like, sweet, I'm going to get my little dream come true. And so we went and we stayed. We booked a room at this hotel. And as we were walking into the hotel, I'll never forget this moment because I was burnt out and tired. It felt good to be back in Guatemala. But I was like, what am I doing with this 
retreat center. I'm way in over my head. I have no clue what I'm doing. I'm digging through solid rock. Like it's, it's impossible. I got a text message from that pastor that I had met in Alabama one time. And he said, man, stop building those things on your own. Our church is taking you on as our mission project this year. We're going to finish those cabins for you. And I cried, and I cried hard. But what was really fascinating to me was this, is the, the timing of it. Because I felt like God was saying, hey, you remember all those seeds your dad planted? Remember all the seeds he planted bringing those teams, those mission teams to come help other people? Well, now I'm going to bring a harvest to you, and it's coming in the form of a mission team. They're coming to bail you out. And I just remember thinking, what, you know, God's timing, just to put a little cherry on top, like, hey, buddy, I got your back. I got this. And one, one thing I want to share this morning is if you're a father, don't ever doubt the value of the seeds you're planting and the sacrifices you're making right now. And you may not see all the full bloom and fruit and the tree from it, but your kids will. And if you plant seeds and you stick around long enough, you will reap a harvest. So let's not grow weary in doing good. For the right time, we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. You may be a dad here. You're like, man, it'd just be so much easier just throw in the towel on this whole thing. Walk away. Don't do it. Stay in the game because your sacrifices will not go unrewarded. And it may be the result. You'll see it in your kids. And I'm a living example of that because of my father's sacrifices. We're seeing the blessing of that. So the cabins are almost done. We're getting them almost done. Well, a few months ago, I felt like the Lord said, I need you to go all in. And I was like, I thought I already went all in. And I, we felt like we needed to sell our house in San Antonio, move out to Kerrville to live on the property and get the retreat center going. We'd make a long drive from here. I talked to Pastor Marcus about it, and he's like, hey, I'm not kicking you out. As long as you're willing to drive, come on in. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going anywhere. You're still going to see a lot of me. But I called some mentors of mine, some of my board, and they said, yeah, we feel like you're supposed to go out there and live out there. And I was like, okay, well, we sold our house like quickly. Emily came down one morning and she said, I feel like we're supposed to sell it right away, like put the house on the market right away. So I went down to Home Depot. I bought a yard sign, said for sale by owner, and we had offers within 24 hours. Sold the house, but then we were like, uh, we got nowhere to live because the cabins aren't ready. <laughs> And those cabins aren't for us anyway. <laughs> so I started freaking out. Emily started praying. I started freaking out. <laughs> and long story short, we ended up getting an RV that we're going to live in. And we rolled the RV out onto the property and we moved out there Thursday. And it's weird because it feels like a step backwards in my life. I'm, I'm in my 40s. This is the time I'm supposed to get the bigger house buy the nicer car, and instead, we're literally going back to ground zero. We're living in a tiny 350 square foot, if that, I don't even know what it is, uh, RV. And we're plowing our way through rock to get this thing going. So here's what I know about everybody in this room. Right now in front of you, you've got a mountain of rock that you're trying to plow your way through, and it feels impossible, and some of you want to give up. Some of you, it's, it's your financial situation. You just, you're looking at the way things are going and the price of fuel, and you're just like, we can't keep this up. I saw a stat last week that said a credit card debt in the last two months has gone to an all-time high in America. It's never been higher. People are just, they're, they're running out of money, and they're having to charge, use credit. So maybe you're in that situation. You're one of those people, and you're like, financially, I don't know how we can sustain this. With the job I've got, with the cost of living, I don't know how we can do this. Some of you, it's in a relationship. Man, you've just been plowing hard ground trying to get that relationship back on track with your son or daughter, but they're just not coming home. They're not talking to you, and you're just plowing. Some of you, it's in your marriage. You're just like, man, we seem, it seems like we like get a little bit ahead, and then it's like some, we drop off the cliff, and we have to climb back up to where we started from. Every one of us, we've got some sort of a mountain in our lives that it's going to require a lot of faith to get through. And, and, and if you're not there yet, trust me, over the next few months, the next few years, I think it's going to require a level of faith and belief from Christians like we've never seen before. And I'm not talking about faith that's just belief. I'm talking about faith that is action. Amen. There's this story in 2 Kings, the fascinating story of a guy named Elisha and a guy named Joash. Joash, he's a king of Israel. Joash is not a good king. 
bad king. But he has some respect for Elisha. It's like, it's like politicians. You ever notice how politicians, they like kind of stay in good graces with the big preachers? Billy Graham. Oh, Billy Graham. I met with him. Or Rick Warren. You see these politicians, they kind of keep an arm's length distance. They're like, I need the spiritual guy, but I need my power. Well, this is the relationship Joash had with Elisha. But it says, when Elisha had fallen sick with illness of which he was to die, Joash, the king of Israel, went down to him and wept before him. Now, you got to understand something. Israel's in bad shape at this time. Because Syria, their neighbor, has been invading them and stealing all of their weapons and leaving them destitute and pulling them out of their towns. And Joash is like, man, I need the man of God to like stand up here and like speak up. So he goes and he says to him, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And you're like, what does this mean? There's lots of conjecture about what this means. But what's fascinating is this is the thing that Elisha said to his mentor, Elijah, right as Elijah was being taken up to heaven. He said, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. So it's basically, he's saying, I'm acknowledging that you are a spiritual man who has that connection to that spiritual economy, that spiritual world, and I need your help, but you're about to die here. What are we going to do? So Elisha said to him, Elisha asked some weird stuff. There's some weird stories with Elisha and Elijah. Elisha said to him, take a bow and arrows. So this king takes the bow and arrows. And then he said to the king of Israel, draw the bow. And he drew it, and Elisha laid his hands on the king's hands as he was doing it. Now, next, next slide. He pulls back to shoot, opened the window eastward, and he opened it. So he opens this window, and, and Elisha says, now shoot. So the king shot the arrow. And then he said, the Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Syria. He basically said, you're going to get victory over Syria. Now, you shall fight the Syrians in Aphek until you have made an end of them. And then he said, now take the arrows, and he took them. So he grabs the arrows out of the quiver, he takes them, and he says, and he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground with them. And he struck the ground three times and stopped. What does that have to do with anything? Why would you have somebody strike the ground with arrows? But the man of God, Elisha, was angry with him and said, you should have struck it five or six times. Then you would have struck down Syria until you had made an end of it. But now you will strike down Syria only three times times this is so bizarre i've been i was thinking a lot about this passage like why would he have him do this and i think part of the reason was was first of all he was dealing with a king and he was asking the king to do something that made him look foolish it's manly to draw an arrow and and bow an arrow and shoot that right that's a very manly thing to do but to take the arrows and hit them on the ground it's something that made him look foolish And oftentimes God will ask us in an act of faith before he brings the deliverance you're looking for to do something that in terms of the economies of man, in terms of the way the world works, looks completely foolish. And you might end up looking like a fool. But if you want the results of your faith, the real results, oftentimes he will ask you to step out and do things that are risky, they're scary, and people around you are going to be going, What are you thinking? This is the worst possible time to do that. What if you fail? What if you fail? Here's the other thing about this that I think is fascinating. They had already taken all the weapons of Israel. The last thing this guy had was his bow and arrow, right? And I think, I was like, well, why did he only strike it three times? And I kind of wonder, arrows are kind of delicate things. If you're beating them on the ground, there's a good chance you'd break your arrows. And I kind of wonder if... The king only struck him on the ground three times because he was worried, what if I break the last thing I have that'll protect me if God doesn't come through? And oftentimes God will call us to beat the ground and potentially risk the very thing we have as our safety net for our own security, our own protection, in order to get us where he wants us to go. Sometimes he'll ask you to go all in with that money that you had set aside Somebody in the first service said that they had kind of a a backup home in case their marriage didn't work out. They'd have a place to live and not be destitute. And this person told me they felt like God told them to sell this house and go all in on this marriage and not have a backup plan. Wow, that's powerful. Sometimes God will ask you to do stuff that causes you to take the very thing that's your sense of protection, strike it on the ground looking foolish, and potentially break it so that you have to go all in and trust that only Through him, are you going to get to the place that he wants for you? And that, my friends, is real faith. Because here's the thing about faith. Oh, really, one interesting thing. Right after this, this passage, it says, And then Elisha died, 
And they took his body and threw it into a grave. And the body, that when Elisha's body hit the dead body in the grave, that dead body in the grave came back to life. That song we sang, the first, first song, just ask the man who's, who is, who is, uh, whose bones were thrown on the body of Elijah. Yeah, the guy's body came back to life. It's the craziest story. Anyways, I thought that was interesting. So faith, here's the thing about faith. Next slide. Your actions, based on your beliefs, reveal your level of faith in your belief. Everybody's like, I got faith, I got faith. Really? How, how much are you willing to step out based on that faith? And what you're unwilling to sacrifice is probably an idol or a god for you. Now again, there's a fine line between foolishness and faith. And sometimes God will ask you to do stuff that's faith that looks like foolishness, but you've got to seek counsel around you. If you're married, always check with your spouse. Make sure they're in agreement with that. But you don't really know how much something, somebody believes in something until they're willing to step out and act on it. That's real faith. Faith is, I believe this so much, I'm going to take a step based on it. Anybody can say they believe in something, but are you going to put your money where your mouth is? Are you going to go all in? And oftentimes, God will ask you to start again with nothing. One of my favorite quotes by Anna Jim Peterson, he says, beginning empty-handed and alone frightens the greatest of people. But it also shows how confident they are that God is with them. If you're willing to lay down everything that you've been holding on to, to do what he's calling you to do, surrender your life to whatever he says, it shows who your confidence is in. It's not in your money. It's not in your job. It's not in your power. It's not in how smooth and eloquent you are and how great of a manipulator you are and how powerful of a personality you have. Are you willing to lay it all on the line? Because that's real confidence. In fact, it says that faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Faith, James says, faith apart from works is dead. You can say you're faith, full of faith all the time, but are you going to act it out and work? Irenaeus said it, you've got to work as if it depends on you and pray as if it depends on God because both are true. That's right. That's right. And when you start taking this kind of action and belief, it really has a way of getting God's attention. It's almost as if he says, oh, you're going to put yourself in a vulnerable position? Now I can come through and show you my power. But if you're keeping it all in your own hands, you may never get to experience that. So there's this story where Jesus, he's walking around, and it says a centurion, Jesus came to Capernaum, his hometown, and a centurion came forward to him. So basically an army from the oppressors, that were, the, the Roman government was oppressing the Jews, and a guy in the army of the oppressors came to Jesus. And he said, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. Jesus is like, all right, I'll go heal him. You're the enemy, essentially. Your people are oppressing my people, but I'm going to do my thing and I'm going to go heal him. But the centurion replied, oh Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I am a man under authority as well with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. To my servant, do this, and he does. Jesus was shocked by this. It's when Jesus heard this, he marveled. Literally, Jesus is like, yeah, yeah, whoa, whoa. You got my attention now. There's a way you can get God's attention, and it's by showing great faith so much so that you believe in what God can do, no matter what the circumstances are. And he says this, Jesus says this, hey guys, all you people from Israel, look, the oppressing army here, look at this. With no one in Israel have I found such faith. Amongst all you people, I haven't seen faith, but look at this guy. He's one of the bad guys. He says, I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, <clears throat> while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, let me make something really clear here. Outer darkness, weeping, and gnashing of teeth is not hell. If you're in Christ, there's no condemnation. This is not talking about going to hell if you fail to act on your faith. What this is saying, weeping and gnashing of teeth is a Hebrewism for a place of regret. And what he's saying here is there's going to be a lot of people who when they get to heaven, they're going to get in the door because, because of Jesus they got in the door, not anything they did. But when they get up there, they're going to go, why didn't I trust God more? Why didn't I do more of 
risky things that he asked me to do? Why did I always play it safe? They're going to have regrets of what could have been. And if you read the regrets of uh, the, the things that dying people say, is, is a lot of them say, I wish I would have taken more risks. And Jesus is saying, some of you out there, look, you're going to get in the door, but you're going to regret not having taken more risks in life, not having stepped out more on faith and shown your faith by actions. And you're going to wonder what could have been. And you'll still be in the gate and there'll be glory and bliss in heaven, but you'll be wondering, oh, what could have been? And to the centurion, he said, previous one, if you want. And to the centurion, Jesus said, go, let it be for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. So here's my final point. Humbly acknowledging your need is the way, and, and God's power to meet that need is the path to seeing God move. Whatever your situation is, whatever the giant rock mountain is you're facing this morning, that you're trying to trench your way through and you're not getting any headway, know this, the best possible thing you can do is give up. And when I say give up, I don't mean give up, give up. I mean give up your own confidence in yourself. Men, this is hard for us. Fathers out there, think we got to be strong. We want to provide for our family. And yes, it is noble to provide for your family. But oftentimes God will ask you to do stuff that looks like taking a step backwards. In my life, it's looked like moving into an RV with my family until God provides whatever it is. To work with next. I don't know what's next. I want a house, but we don't have the money for it, right? So we're living in this RV temporarily. And God will often ask you to do stuff that looks foolish. He'll ask you to take risks that, that people go, what are you thinking? And one of the best things you can do is humbly acknowledge your need for God. Put yourself in a situation where he needs to come through for you, where you've let go of all of your own arrows, the things that you think can, you can protect yourself with, whether it's your money or your power or your prestige or the backup or whatever it is in your marriage, if it's the backup relationship, that person you keep on Facebook from high school that you're like, ah, oh, if, if this falls apart, I got to go to. You need to go all in. There comes a point where you've got to go all in, cash in all the chips and go for broke if you want to live this life of faith. And that's a hardcore message, but I'm telling you this. It's on the ragged edge of living that way that you find what you're really looking for. And I'm not blowing sunshine at you. It's hard, okay? I'm living in the middle of it right now. It's very hard. On the drive here this morning, I was thinking, what in the world are we doing? But I know, I've seen this, you cannot sacrifice for God. He won't let you. As soon as you think you've made this epic sacrifice for God, he'll go, watch this. Whoosh, open the floodgates and he pours out blessings on you you never could have seen coming. Right in the middle of lack and need and a crazy financial situation, God's providing abundantly, exceedingly, abundantly far above all you could ever ask or think according to his power at work in you. But you've got to be willing to take the step of action on faith. And some of you, you just need to humble your freaking self. Get on your knees and say, God, I'm done. I can't do it anymore. And he says, perfect. Now I can step in and do what you could never do. I'll breathe in your direction and I'll launch you to a place you could never get on your own. But you've got to put yourself in that position. And it's scary. Trust me, it's scary. But listen, it's going to be hard either way. I'd rather it be hard with me living depending on God's ability to provide than my own ability to provide. And the crazy thing is, I don't know how it works, but when you're faithful and you're generous and you're seeking counsel, you're seeking God's wisdom, right in the middle of chaos around you, right in the middle of the worst possible time, God can provide in ways you never could have done on your own. One touch of his favor can launch you into the future. One phone call, one chance meeting, he can launch you to the place he wants you to go. You've just got to be willing to humbly admit your need for him. Put yourself in a position that requires his intervention and stop trying to do it on your own. You guys receive that? Yes. Let me pray for you. <laughs> Father, we thank you that all power in heaven and earth is given to you. You are the most powerful force in the universe. No one can stop you. No one can hold you back. When you decide to move, no one can stop you. So we humbly surrender ourselves and submit to you, Lord, this morning. I pray for everyone here, the many needs they're facing, the giant stone rock mountain they're dealing with, 
whatever it is, their relationships, their finances, their job, their business, whatever it is, Lord, I just thank you that we are going to see abundant provision even through this time of financial struggle. We believe the righteous will not be forsaken. The righteous will live, be lights in this world of confidence in you, not because of our own ability, but you're going to provide in ways we never could have seen coming as we obey you faithfully. If you're here this morning, you've not given your life to Jesus, started that relationship with him, I'm going to say a prayer in just a second. If you say this prayer and you mean it in your heart, he's going to forgive you of your sins, transfer you from the kingdom of darkness, and transfer you into the kingdom of light. Say this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sins. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.